Galatians 4. Turn there. Galatians 4. Good to be here this morning. Again, we're glad to be back. And uh, the Lord, again, I heard some great, uh, was only there long enough to hear two messages. Uh, Pastor Villines preached Friday night. And um, I'll think of his name in a minute. Derek Stennett, evangelist, uh, preached yesterday morning before me, preached a good message. And uh, both these guys didn't mind quoting scripture while they were preaching. Imagine that. And um, I've, I asked, I was preaching at sort of a pastor's conference one time. And I said to them, do we believe that a person can be saved without the word of God? And they all said no. I said, but is it possible that we can get them to the altar without the word of God? Yes. You can stir up emotions. You can do that at a ball game. You can do that at a funeral. You can do it at a Trump rally. <laughs> okay. You can stir up emotions in a church service with music, with words that you say, with fair speeches, the Bible says. You can do that. You can get them to the altar, but that's not saving them. Our words mean nothing up next to the Word of God. So I was encouraged by that, and it was a, it was a blessing to go down there. I needed preach to, preach that. And um, so anyway, Galatians chapter 4. I, I spent a lot of money. Some of it was my mom and dad's money. Some of it was the government's money. Some of it my own. Um, in three years of Bible college. Two different Bible colleges. And the subject of typology barely got mentioned. And I even took a class on systematic theology. What we believe about God, what we believe about the Bible and so on. And again, typology is something that you look up in a dictionary. You know, the word. And that's, that's about the extent of its teaching. And to me, the study of typology and understanding what it is and how it works, to me... Uh, nothing better, there is nothing better to open up your eyes to the meaning of Scripture. It's like, think of the Bible as a children's book. A children's book isn't 800 pages long with all words in it. Children's books have pictures in it. So that the storyline can be understood by the pictures. And God drew pictures in our Bible of doctrine, of prophecy, of what he means when he said this particular thing. And so this morning, this is the subject that Galatians 4 brings us to. And so I'm going to sort of give you the biblical basis of why I believe what I believe about typology. To me... Um, Typology just, it really opens my eyes. And as I'm thinking of, let's say I'm reading the scripture and I'm pondering a particular passage and I have an idea that I wonder if it could mean this. Uh, sometimes my ideas are way out on Mars somewhere. I mean, they're out there. So the question I ask is, number one, can I find a second witness in scripture? Number two, is there a picture of that in the Bible? Is there, a, is there an illustration? Pastors use illustrations all the time. The best illustrations to use are the ones that God gives us out of his word. That way they're not, they're not ever wrong. So we have a picture. I believe of every doctrine and every prophecy in the Bible, we have a picture of it. I'll give you an example. We have Christ, we have Antichrist. Men 
in the Bible represent either Christ or Antichrist. Okay, that's the representation. So here is the story of, I'll give you an easy one. 1 Samuel 17, David, Goliath, which is which? David is Christ. How do we know? What identifies David as Christ? He's a shepherd. Okay. He destroy, he's, the, he's the captain. He destroys the enemy, defeats the enemy. What is he used to do it with? A stone first, then what? Sword. Okay. So then who is Goliath in this story? He would be Antichrist. So what identifies Goliath with the Antichrist? Number one, his height. Six. We know that at least one of the giants had six fingers on each hand, six fingers on each foot, or six toes. Sorry, that'd be weird. <laughs> six toes on each foot. Um, I think his spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So he has these numbers attached to him. And then David says this. David says to Saul, thy servant, me, David, slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Well, in Revelation 13, the beast is identified as a lion and a bear. Okay, and, and the first time that I thought about this, I'm going, whoa! And how does Goliath die? He has a wound in his head. In Revelation 13, the beast... One of his heads was wounded, as it were, to death. And so that helps you understand. So in the end, who wins? Christ does. David did. He's the one who wins the battle. So you can take that and practically any story, I believe, would have typological merit. In other words, it would help you understand what you're reading in the scriptures. As long as you apply it correctly. As long as you let the Bible be the guide to that. So Galatians chapter 4 verse 21. Uh, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written. Now he's going to tell a story. He's going to tell a story that's in the Bible. One that we know. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Let me stop right here. Because I came across this last night. I never really thought about it before. Uh, is there other places in the Bible, and you could look this up, the phrase two sons is found several times in the scripture. Jesus taught at least two parables that I'm aware of where he said a certain man had two sons. One of them I'm going to preach about this morning. In fact, both of them. Both stories that Jesus taught, taught about two sons. And one was significantly different than the other. One received the inheritance, one didn't. Think of, think of somebody in the Bible who had two sons. We know what Abraham did. Who else did? Jacob. He had who? No, you're thinking of Isaac. Yeah, I make the same mistake, Cubby. I'm going, Jacob. Yeah, and his son Esau. No. It was Isaac, and he had two sons. And both of them are significantly different. One from the other. One receives the inheritance, the other doesn't. Okay? So that's a story. That's a type. That, by the way, that also could go along with what we're seeing here in Galatians 4. Paul could have very easily used the same illustration with uh, Jacob and Esau. But he says, anyway, that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. They are different. But he who was of the bondwoman, who was Hagar, was born after the flesh. And stop and think about the story, what you remember about the story. It would help if you go back and read the story. Because the clues are in the, de the details are there. So whose idea was it that Abraham go to Hagar? Yeah, Abraham would have never brought that up. Right? You know, Sarah, I was thinking, she'd have beat him over the head with a cast iron skillet. But it was Sarah's idea. Sarah was weak in faith. 
And she said, maybe God meant this. Forgive me, ladies. That's, I'm, there's two occasions right there that I can quote to you verbatim where a woman altered scripture. Eve did it when she added the phrase, neither can ye touch it, to what God said. And then here, Sarah is offering an alternative explanation of what God said by sort of saying, well, maybe God meant this. And you can take those two illustrations right there and say, because women in the Bible represent churches, types of churches. In the book of Proverbs, there is a, uh, a wise woman and there is a strange woman. So the wise woman represents a church that is following Christ, following his word, staying in his word. And then the strange woman represents churches who lead people to hell because her steps lead people to hell. They, they, go, they forget the covenant of her God. They forget God's covenant and they lead people away from it. So you have illustrations here where you have two women who have decided to interpret God's word incorrectly or relay God's word in an incorrect manner. And that's pictures of churches that do that. So uh, Sarah said, maybe God meant that since Hagar is my slave, my servant, that if you go in unto her, she would raise up seed for me in my place. God allowed that to happen. Abraham went into Hagar and she brought forth Ishmael. But it was, it became very clear. God told Abraham, that's not who I had, that's, that's not the son that I said. I said it was going to be Sarah. That's what I said. So listen to what I'm saying. It will be Sarah. So that was the mistake that she made. But anyway, verse 23, uh, verse 22, the one by bond made the other by a free woman. Verse 23, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. Underline that word in your Bible. If you underline phrases, underline allegory. That's about the only time I think you can find the word allegory in your Bible. Now, in literature, an allegory you ever heard of the word alleged? And how do we use that word? He allegedly said this, or he allegedly did this. What do we, what do we take that to mean? He, he may have done it, but he may not have done it. Somebody said he did, okay? So that would be the strict interpretation of it. But in this case, you have to remember that in literature, an allegory could be a fable, like Aesop's fables. Aesop's fables were stories that, that had some learning meaning to them, but none of the stories were true. But in the Bible's case, the story has to be true. Can you believe that there was no whale that swallowed Jonah? No, you can't believe that because Jesus used specifically Jonah and that whale to say, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And if Jonah never did that, Christ lied. Because Christ said he did. But the scholars, oh, they hate that story. There's no whale that ever swallowed somebody how do you live in there well we don't know that we just know that god prepared one because that's what the bible says the lord prepared a great fish to swallow up jonah and even the phrase swallow up that has to do with first corinthians 15 death is swallowed up in victory okay 
because it has to do with Christ's uh, burial and resurrection. So anyway, the, the word allegory in the Bible case, the story is true. And you have to believe the story is true. Because God would not tell a lie to reveal a truth. God is not a man that he should lie. Paul said we've not followed cunningly devised fables. We didn't follow make-believe stories. These are not fairy tales. These are real events. So, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants that matches. The, so, Ishmael and Hagar represent one covenant. Sarah and Isaac represent the other. These are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Now he's explaining it to you. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, not in Egypt. Mount Sinai, if you look on a map, the Sinai Peninsula was named that. I um, can't remember who did it. Some famous guy in history somewhere went traveling through Egypt and he said, that looks like it could be Mount Sinai. And so he, he named it Mount Sinai. And there's a monastery on Mount Sinai where we get the Sinaiticus Greek text of the Bible, which is one of those corrupt Greek texts. But that's not Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is not in Egypt. It's in Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And it's been found. And the top of that mountain is still black as the ace of spades to this day, charred black by the presence of God there. And you can see evidence of water. There. I mean, there's all kinds of things there. The, the altar, the stone altar that Moses built is on the base of that mountain. And it's cool to see. And since its discovery, the government of Saudi Arabia has fenced off that whole area. Big sign saying, keep out or we will shoot you. Okay. They don't want anybody up there. But anyway, uh, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered through bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, verse 25, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. The Jerusalem of the Middle East Jerusalem, that Jerusalem. And, and what he's saying is, all of the Jews, or anybody else for that matter, who believes that God saves by the Old Testament law, you're in bondage. You're in bondage because you broke the very law that you think you have to keep in order to go to heaven. Uh, verse 26, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, this is Isaiah 54, Thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So what I'm going to do this morning, maybe a little bit next Sunday morning, is just go through the scriptures, show you how the Bible is pointing you in the direction of typology. Uh, in literature, it's called foreshadowing. A lot of famous literary works, as you're reading the beginning of the book, there's something that happens at the beginning that will give you, that will foreshadow the ending. There are uh, movie directors who will use foreshadowing in their movies. They will have something sort of toward the beginning of the movie that sort of tells you how this thing all turns out, how it ends up. It's called foreshadowing. And actually, the word shadow is used in the Bible to illustrate typology. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Actually, I have up here uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 6 along with that. So let's read a little bit out of 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Paul is going to use the illustration of the Israelites wandering through the wilderness to teach the doctrine, teach his doctrine. 
And this is not the first time or the only time that Paul uses Israel in the wilderness as an illustration. He does it often. In fact, the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the majority of it is typology of the law and what the law stood for. Verse 2, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ, capital R. So the Bible's telling you that, you remember that rock that Moses smote where the water came forth? That rock, in typology language, in the symbolism of it, that rock was Christ. And what did Jesus say? Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ is the rock. He's the, in Daniel 2, he's the stone cut without hands. In uh, 1 Peter 2, he's the living stone. And we then as lively stones do make up the house of God. So Christ was that rock. And that rock apparently followed them. Don't know how it walked. But every place they went, now, I don't know if it was the exact same rock showing up in all these places or it was just a rock that once again water comes from. But that rock was there. They did all drink. Uh, verse five. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse six. Underline this. He uses the word examples. Now, these were our examples. So this cuts into the doctrine of, you've heard me use this phrase, dispensationalism, which says that at different times in the Bible, God had a different gospel. So there was a, there was a different gospel for Noah, a different gospel for Abraham, a different gospel for Moses and the Israelites, and a different gospel for us now, which that cannot be true. Because if in the dispensation of Moses, God had a law or a gospel that allowed works for salvation, then Paul, and, and here's what I was told by some dispensationalists, you can't get your doctrine on salvation from the Old Testament because it's not there. And I'm going, is too. No, it ain't. Is too. Is too. I mean, how many times did Jesus, Paul, quote from some of them, Josiah, even go to the extent to say none of the four Gospels and part of the New Testament apply to us only the works of Paul. Some of them strictly limit what they, how they understand salvation only from the writings of Paul, which is unbiblical. All scripture is given to us. Uh, by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. All scripture is. So Paul makes it very clear that the way God dealt with Israel and what he did then is the same way that he's going to deal with us right now because God doesn't change. Doesn't change. So these things were our examples to the intent, verse 6, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So it's like, it's like having an older sister who has a string attached to a loose tooth and that string running over to the front door and mom slamming that door to pull that tooth out. And I'm watching this. And I'm watching my sister scream in horror. Because it didn't work the first five times. No, I was going. I never told my mom I had a loose tooth after that. Never. I waited until I could go. I got a loose tooth. That was my, she was my example to not do that. Amen? Well, Israel is your example 
to not lust after evil things. You think God's different now? You think God's softened in his old age? No way. Verse 7, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three, and 20, 23,000 people died one day. That's an example. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, verse 11 is another verse teaching you typology now all these things not just some of them all these things happened unto them for in samples and the word sample is in that word you get a picture a a, a glimpse of how god works how he does things so that as you're reading the new testament you're reading the gospel you're reading doctrine you go back to typology and you look to see how God applied his will, his sovereignty and everything about him. It's all illustrated for us in those stories. I mean, the Bible could have just been a rule book that said, this is what you believe. This is what you don't believe. And, it, you know, item A, B, C and so on. But God didn't do that. God wrote a children's book for us children because he knew we would have a hard time understanding him. So he drew these pictures for us. And they're amazing pictures. Whales that swallow people and then puke them back up three days later. That's amazing. All right. All these things happen to unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come verse 12 gives you the the gist of it wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall then you can keep going verse 13 there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man so why does the bible have all these stories in it because i guarantee you you're going to find one one day that matches what's going on in your life you ever had that happen before absolutely absolutely it's all there it's not just the book of life it's the book of your life and my life is in this book my failures my victories every one of them is there there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it so all of this that paul set up and told us he said in verse 11 they're in samples in verse 6 they're examples but they're written uh these things have i written to you that you may know that you have eternal life so these things are written to us for our learning our admonition to encourage us to keep on going but to warn us if Israel, so we have in Hebrews, we have the retelling of the 12 spies going into Canaan land. And whoever the writer of Hebrew was, I think it was Paul, but we don't know. But he makes that illustration very clear that we are to not follow their example. But falling into unbelief. Because they just flat didn't believe God anymore. They listened to the 10 spies tell them, we can't go back in there. We'll get, well, get killed and we'll get slaughtered. We got two guys saying, yeah, we can. The Bible says they had a different spirit in them than the other ten. That'll, that'll wake you up. Because with the spirit of God, you think differently. You think, maybe I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Amen? So that's two, that's two places there in, in the same chapter. Gives you in samples and examples. Turn to Second Peter 2. Second Peter two, if you look at verse one, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So there's one word in the Bible that will generally, I won't say always, 
but it'll generally give you an idea or a clue that you're looking at typology. It's the word as. So who, who knows a verse that has the word as in it from the Bible? As it was in the days of Noah. Okay? I knew somebody would say that. That's the first thing that pops in mind. As it was in the day. Yes, Emily. Be wise as certain. Okay, yeah, I get that. Yeah, but anyway, but he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Ecclesiastes tells us, you know, the wind blows like this, the water goes like this, the sun goes like this, so does the moon. Everything repeats itself. Everything repeats itself. Okay? Okay. You'll catch that. So Solomon says, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. So you want to know how it's going to happen in the future? Look at how it happened in the past. That's typology. God put that story in there, preserved it for us. So when we, when we, if we want to know, if we're going to, if we're going to write a book, about end times prophecy, you've got to use the examples that God gives you in the Bible. And the, all of these things point to it. But Noah's story, Noah is about the end of the world, God ending the world. The numbers, the numbers matter. Colors, colors. If I mention the color red, biblically, what, is, what does the color red represent? Sin, though your sins be as, okay? So then the color white, which some say is not a color, but white represents purity, okay? Um, purple. What does purple represent scripturally? Wealth. What else? Royalty, okay? Clo- she, the, the harlot's clothed in purple and scarlet. So even colors matter. Um, objects, a rod, a stone, a tree, a stick, iron, gold, objects like that, a cup, a cup is symbolic of something, but always stick with the Bible's definition instead of somebody else's. Um, I remember reading after Tim LaHaye made his millions of dollars writing the Left Behind series. He made a few bucks extra because he had written a commentary on the book of Revelation. And I don't know how well it sold before the Left Behind books, but after the Left Behind books, they repackage it, put the Left Behind cover on it, and it's Tim LaHaye's commentary on the book of Revelation. Now, I remember reading in there that Tim LaHaye, when he was talking about the seven thunders in Revelation 10, the seven thunders sounded... And John was about to write, and God said, you know, write it not. Tim LaHaye said, now the seven thunders are the seven stages of the Roman Empire. And I went, what bucket did you pull that from? Okay? I have no idea. And I, number one, never read that in Scripture anywhere. Number two, he made the mistake of going outside of the Scriptures to interpret something in the scriptures. And that's a big mistake. It'll mess you up every time. Okay? So, uh, he says, there were false prophets also, as there shall be false teachers among you. Now look at verse 6, which is what I have on the screen. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample, there's that word again, unto those, underline that word, unto those that after should live ungodly. Pay attention to what he's saying here. He does not just say those who are sodomites. He said those who live ungodly. You don't have to be a sodomite to go to hell. But if you're ungodly, you'll go to hell. And if you look, just glance there at 2 Peter 2, 
um, verse 4, God spared not the angels that sinned. Okay, what is he talking about? He's, he's not talking about Satan and his one-third. He's talking about the ones who married the women and made the giants. That's who he's talking about because these angels were cast into hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And they're still there now. Okay, so Noah, verse 5, that's typology. Sodom and Gomorrah, that's typology. Verse 7, Lot, the story of Lot, that's typology. And God delivered Lot. He didn't leave him in Sodom, put a bubble around him, or put him in a bunker. He delivered him before his wrath fell from heaven. Okay? He delivered him before that happened. Uh, and we have, other, we have other illustrations of how God, God delivered Noah before the rain fell. God told Noah, on the day that's going to happen, get, get into the ark. Get into the ark. So... Um, turn to Hebrews 4. Go back a little bit. And I mentioned this earlier. Hebrews chapter 4. If you just kind of browse through uh, Hebrews 4, um, you see in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And the context is he's speaking about Israel as they're in the wilderness and they had traveled for about a year and God was giving them now the option to go ahead and go into the promised land. All they had to do was believe the report. Joshua and Caleb, who came back and said, God said, we're going to eat them for breakfast. They're, they're going to be meals for us. They're going to fall before us. God is going to destroy them and give them into our hands. Why don't we go? And so he uses that in verse 2. The gospel is preached to us as well as unto them. Because it's about deliverance. But it's not mixed with faith. So on down in verse 11. He says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Example. And here he's talking about falling again. In uh, 1 Corinthians 10, they fell in the wilderness. Here, they fell in the wilderness. What is it that Paul said is going to happen? For there shall come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the sin of perdition. Okay, so um, let's see here. I saw something else in this chapter too I was going to point out. Um, but anyway, he's teaching you the ideas of typology. He's telling you to go back and read. And again, three years in Bible college, all this money spent, they, I barely remember. But when God led me to study prophecy, 1997... God reminded me of typology. And I'd never really thought about it before. But over and over and over, God began to open my eyes to these events in the Bible that matched what God was going to do prophetically. And my wife, I drove my wife nuts during those days. Because once the idea sank in, I would just be driving somewhere and all of a sudden I'd go, huh! and it's scare her. It's like, what? You know, she's looking for a car crash or something. And God was showing me something, type, typology, out of the Bible. And it was new to me. And I was just going, oh, that is so cool. I can remember one night I was in the living room. And I just, all of a sudden I went, whoa, whoa. And I went running to the bedroom. So I could look up something on the computer, on the Bible search software that I had back then. And she's like, what is wrong with you? You know. I'm fine. After a while, she got used to it. Okay? I'm not done. Uh, since you're there, turn to Jude very quickly. He uses the word example again. So the words 
you can do this, you can do your own study. Look at the words in sample, example, shadow. Do the word shadow. Figure. I had that up on the screen. Like I said, I think he only used this allegory once in the Bible. But Jude, here again, he's mentioning Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. Underline that. If God did it this way, then he's going to do it this way now. Same God, same action. In like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after what? Strange flesh. You want me to blow your mind? You know what the word strange is linked to in your Bible? Alien. Alien. Because it's strange. It's different. And what did the women in the days before Noah do? They went after strange flesh. Because those sons of God who were not born here came down and took them wives. Those women went after alien flesh. I'm like the guy on Ancient Aliens, you know, with the big hair. He was aliens. I'm telling you, he was aliens. Okay. But he said, they went after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They, they were an example. And they are an example to this country. But this country doesn't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. Nancy Pelosi and her sodomite crowd out there in San Francisco, they want nothing to do with the Bible. They don't want to believe that it's true because if God did what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah and the other two cities, he's going to do that to America. If it's the same God, okay? So, so anyway, that's your first lesson on typology, all right? Father, we love you and we thank you for this book. Open our eyes. Show us great and mighty things. Show us similitudes, Father. Things that are similar to what you're going to do in our life. In our life, not just prophecy, but today. There are examples in this book of everything I've been through. And everything I will go through. And this is why this book is written to us the way it is. And Father, we thank you for that. That we, through patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. If David can fail you and sin and yet be forgiven, then God, we believe you can do the same thing for us. We ask your blessings on your word. Bless these people and bless those that hear it and believe it. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.